teaching planning at Harvard. She, um, a lot of her recent work has been about what does it mean to build a just city? And how do you measure what a just city is? Uh, so I've uh, known Tony for uh, a minute. Years, long time. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it, thank you. And since we're such an intimate group tonight, I'm gonna to try to stay kind of casual with this talk um, and uh, walk you through what I mean by my Just City is Black and White and get, have you learn a little bit about me through the process. So can the front lights come down a moment? Oh, do I need it? Can you hear me? It's on, right? There you go. Okay. Um, can we have the lights down in the front just a little bit? And we maybe even turn this mic down just a little. I feel like I'm extra loud. No. We can make the front uh, darker. That's good. Okay, great. Okay, so. I grew up in Chicago, um, <laughs> South Side. High Park. Give me some. <laughs> okay. So I grew up even further south than that, um, and this is—I um, don't know if you all have seen maps like this before, but this is called a racial dot map. And the blue dots are African American population. The red dots are white population. The orange dots are Hispanic. Uh, and green, and there is some green in there, is Asian. So um, uh, these have been reproduced for most major cities in the U.S., and it's a reminder to us that while we may believe that we're socializing more and we're in more diverse spaces and parts of our life, we still live in really segregated spaces and cities. And uh, this is, um, I think, from 2010. Um, so, we're still living in segregated cities. I grew up in a segregated city. I can spend most of my day as a child before I went away to college, surrounded by mostly black folks. I could have all of my needs met. When I went downtown is when I was mostly exposed to others. When I went to high school, I was about 98% black. So, that was my, my, my upbringing. Um, this is first grade, and I am in this photo right there. <laughs> And so this is a picture where uh, it's not like you find, as my dad would say, the ink spot. It's like, where do you find the kid that's not of color uh, in the picture? And I think there were only two or three in my class at the time. And I grew up in this, uh, near the historic Pullman neighborhood in Chicago. So how did I come to want to be an architect? Um, I certainly didn't know any architects as I was growing up and moving through high school. But I did come home after school every day and watch The Brady Bunch. And um, I really liked Mike Brady's office. You know, he kind of sat there drawing all day, and I used to draw all day, and I thought this would be a really great career if I could draw all day. Um, and I went to a high school, I went to Lindblom High School, um, and where they had a drafting rotation. It was a math, science, and uh, tech um, high school. Um, and it's where things kind of connected, and a um, teacher of mine um, would enter my work into these um, art and science and technology competitions every year, and I would win, so I, I had a bit of proficiency in it. And uh, I abandoned notions of being a um, pathologist and a teacher and finally gravitated towards where my natural interests and my natural skills lie, and that was in a more creative space. Um, so I left the south side of Chicago and ended up at the University of Notre Dame, so quite the opposite picture from my first grade uh, class. And I'm way in the back in the shadow of the door of the School of Architecture. Uh, but these were my classmates. There's 47 of us in our class. Uh, and this was at a time where there were only like seven women architects uh, in our class. Now you know, the, the numbers are 50-50, which is uh, fantastic. And there were only three African Americans in my class at the time. 
Um, I then moved into profession the day I graduated from Notre Dame is when I got an offer to work for Skidmore, Orange and Merrill in the Chicago office. Super excited, so I got to work in my hometown. Um, and this is where I first became uh, exposed uh, to architects across the country. This is a photo of me uh, doing my first Mayor's Institute for City Design. But those of you who are here studying in architecture uh, may know, but actually you're at a school that has an extraordinary amount of diversity, so you may not know. Uh, but at the time I entered the field, and for many, um, you end up still operating in a space in, uh, outside of school that is predominantly white and predominantly male. Um, I'm one of 400 some odd um, black women in this country who have ever gotten a license uh, as an architect. I don't practice anymore, but I'm still one of the 400 that took that exam and passed it. <laughs> and practiced, a, practiced as a licensed architect for a number of years. Um, so I, I went to work for SOM. Uh, I got to work on amazing projects uh, in London. Uh, this is Broadgate near Liverpool Street Station with Bruce Graham, who designed the, the Sears Tower and the John Hancock Building. Uh, I got to do some work uh, in Detroit, both as an urban designer uh, and as an architect. Um, and I then took a, a time off to do a low fellowship at Harvard because once I started working in urban design and planning at SOM, I found that that was the scale that I was really most drawn to. And I was drawn to it for a couple of reasons. One is because the client that I tend to have as an urban designer and a planner was more than the single developer and meeting that single developer's needs. I was asked more to consider the broader context of the city or the neighborhood, a number of different sectors and types of people who interact with aspects of the city were really my client. And I found that really interesting. And secondly, I got to work in neighborhoods that I had known all my life as a kid. Uh, so the opportunity to kind of work in a neighborhood where my dad grew up on the south side of Chicago or an opportunity to work uh, in preparation for the Democratic National Convention, which was around the new Bulls arena, and the Bulls were winning at that time. So just to be able to like work in your own backyard was really thrilling to me as a young architect. So I did the Loeb Fellowship and decided to leave SOM and pursue a career in the public sector because I saw that my clients who were mayors and city planners and folks running economic development offices were really shaping the city. You know, they were asking me as a design consultant to come help them figure out what it looked like and how to design it. But they were actually writing the design brief and determining, okay, we need this much housing. We need this type of transportation. We're looking to bring these kinds of companies here. And we were facilitating that. And I said to myself, you know what, I wanna be on that side. I want to direct what I think should happen where, and then I want to bring designers to the table. And I thought I'd be in a unique position to do that because I had been a designer. So I made the switch to the public sector, uh, and my first job uh, as a deputy planning director was working in Washington, D.C., where we uh, accomplished a whole range of scale uh, plans from the downtown to waterfront to corridors and neighborhoods. Um, we looked very comprehensively at the city. This is the map of Washington, D.C. And it was at a time in the mid to early 2000s when um, it was a very strong economy and the growth of the city was beginning to push eastward into neighborhoods that had been historically African-American. The city is very div divided um, along Rock Creek Park and the Potomac River. But all of a sudden, with growth happening, it was starting to push in neighborhoods where disinvestment had happened. And this was a moment in time where as the public sector, we could say, how do we want to use um, public benefit and public good to help balance that growth? Um, so we began looking at areas of the city. This is the Southeast Federal Center along the Anacostia Riverfront uh, and working with the General Services Administration of the federal government, determining how they would use this 55 acres of land uh, to be more inclusive. And so you have this highway here uh, that separates uh, the very Tony Capitol Hill um, from a site of public housing and more industrial uses where you tended to find a lot of public housing locating in the city. So we did a really extensive set of plans. Um, we, we started a, a process of doing, of doing participatory planning where we intentionally set up engagements with different community members and community leaders to be an active part of the discussions and creations of the planning frameworks that we created. And so there's been a lot of development here. This park here, for example, was an international design competition. And we actually put public housing residents on the design jury. So it wasn't just me and Jason, you know, thumb in our nose at design. Uh, we <laughs> 
Uh, he's new, you'll figure that out. Um, but we had people who would actually use the space, actually look at the design from a user's perspective, and we wanted those voices at the table. And the good, the good thing that I, uh, I thought I was able to do in my position was know that, you know, Mrs. Johnson's probably gonna use this park differently than Jason. So if we really wanna design it to be inclusive for all, I need those people at the table to help me think through those kinds of decisions. So that was some of what I got to do, you know, as the public sector, as the person that was the client for the project and not the, necessarily the person with the pen in my hand. Um, but here's the deal. So I've got a, you know, a good body of work. I just showed you, you know, snippets of that in, as I've practiced as an architect, an urban designer, and a planner. And I've worked in Chicago, I've worked in New York, uh, DC, uh, Newark, New Jersey, Detroit, Memphis, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Milwaukee. What I was finding as I've worked in all of those cities over my career um, are the same set of issues and divides. And I was beginning to ask myself, okay, why do I keep confronting the same problem from city to city? Why does this exist? Why does it still exist? Can designers actually have a real sustainable impact in changing this condition? And so here are some of the divides that I find in the different cities that I've been working with. So racial divides, and again, people like to talk about are we moving to a post-racial kind of context? Aren't we living in more integrated spaces? Um, but what we don't remember as people are still fighting for uh, representation and inclusion is that many cities in this country are founded on restricted covenants that intentionally excluded people of different races, religions, and ethnicities from living in different parts of the city. So this is an image uh, from the Jewish Historical Society that's taken from a, a deed restricted covenant for a neighborhood um, that basically says none of these lands, uh, uh, interest therein improvements, may be sold or used or conveyed to a person of Negro blood, Semitic race, Armenians, Jews, Hebrews, Persians, and Syrians. So this is a legally binding document that excludes. So it's important to remember the context and history around how some of our communities have become the way they are. Um, practices um, of blockbusting that real estate um, uh, brokers use where they go in and they undersell or underbuy a property from an African American so they can move in a white family as a way of pushing people out of the neighborhood and clearing areas of the city that were more desirable for other populations. So sometimes we don't like to admit or remember that these things were legally legal practices in this country, but they were. And so some of the conditions when you start to look at those racial dot maps um, are produced because of some of the legacy of, of policy and practice in real estate. Social divides. Um, so we have two Americas. So there's been um, interesting research that, that different um, schools and think tanks are doing, and this was a really interesting reminder for me. So we still have two Americas. So over the past 30 years, the presence of African Americans in a typical white person's neighborhood has barely changed. So here you can see the proportion of, you know, there's a big outcry about gentrification, right? So everyone thinks gentrification is rampant across all cities and all communities. It's not. It's absolutely happening in some communities, but it's not happening in the lion's share. And this is some evidence to bear that out, that we are still not seeing across the board large pushes of moving towards more integrated communities. Um, and thereby, we, as we socialize, our networks are oftentimes not as diverse as we'd like to admit. Most white folks have white friends. Most black folks have black friends although black folks tend to have more integrated groups of friends than white folks or any other groups, right? So we're still, like the way we socialize has something to do with where we live, and where we live has something to do with where we socialize. You know, universities are some of the best places to find integration, but that hasn't begun to move out into neighborhoods in the city yet. Power divides. Um, so I worked in D.C., um, and as I said, one of the things that we did when I was working for Mayor Tony Williams um, is that planning was not uh, engaging the citizens and residents of the city. 
And so people were very fearful of planning. There was a legacy of planning in DC, like a lot of cities that were, as they say, top down, and people didn't know what was coming in their neighborhoods. Um, and we love DC, we love the urban plan and framework of the city, um, but it was designed by a handful of guys uh, down at the bottom, and certainly there was no participatory or, or community meeting that led to LaFont's plan, right? Um, we began to change that very intentionally by the way we did work. Um, we worked with a number of different collaborators um, that have practices as, as, ex, um, explicitly designed around facilitation, mediation, um, and engagement to help us understand how to have meaningful conversations with folks around planning issues. The fourth divide is economic divides. And again, uh, this kind of brings me back to my point around gentrification. There's this great study done um, by Joe Courtright at the University of Portland, who studied um, over 1,000 neighborhoods uh, across the country in larger U US cities, and found that neighborhoods that were poor in 1970 are still poor. That only about 100 neighborhoods had actually gentrified. And his point is simply that we're spending a lot of time tackling the challenges of gentrification, and it's real and it's important, particularly those aspects of gentrification that displace. Um, we should spend more time on addressing the fact that we still have deep pockets of poverty in our cities. And this was exactly what I was talking about, that every city that I went to, this was a condition that I confronted. Uh, this is a study in Minneapolis that begins to show uh, more specific economic disparities. And there are lots of studies that begin to show us that those begin to root themselves in the very spaces of segregation, right? So communities that have low unemployment rates, lower, lower hourly wages, lower home ownership tend to situate themselves in those spatial divides. So I've also been just, I don't know what the word is, angry, bothered, um, upset, traumatized by this constant barrage of assaults. And I don't know about here at your school, and Jason, you were here at the time, but post the uh, 2016 election of President Trump, you know, a lot of our students at our school were just deeply, deeply troubled. And a lot of us had to spend a lot of time in our, in our classes sort of making space for the conversation of like, okay, like now what do we do? And actually questioning whether or not um, planners in particular, whether or not they were gonna have the tools that we often use as planners, federal incentives, housing and urban development, transportation funding, environmental protections. Were those tools gonna be there in the next four years to help me advance my career, right? So there was lots of trauma going on. Um, and a lot of that trauma was around bodies and space, I, I sort of saw. So, you know, the sort of protest around um, women bodies, black bodies, brown bodies, even white bodies, right? They, they were fearful of something as well. LGBTQ bodies, health, the planet, the city, violence, profiling, identity, and whose identity deserved to be in public space, whose story deserved to be in public space, whose stories were excluded from public space. Resistance, protest, right? So it we're just at this moment where like, I could not turn on the news and somebody's body was kind of being assaulted in some way. And when I first did this presentation, I just felt like assault was the only word that I can think of. And I was trying to figure out how the work I do in space and placemaking um, contributes to this, facilitates the improvement of it, um, makes for a more just city. So as I said, I've been in this reflective space and I've had the opportunity now to create two design centers that allow me as a research platform to examine this question. Does the work I do as a planner and designer have an impact on creating more spatial and social justice in the city? Uh, so I began examining, like looking at the conditions of injustice in the city, 
I started creating uh, courses that I taught design for the Just City where we looked at different aspects of design and whether or not I can produce more equity, I can produce more inclusion, I can produce more uh, uh, accessibility, I can produce more safety and security. And it was a question, right? I wasn't at the time actually convinced. There was no evidence uh, that I could use to prove whether or not it was happening or not. And so I wanted to set about doing that. I began reading and, and teaching about different um, um, uh, forms of um, philosophy, sociology, geographers like David Harvey, who were asking questions around whether, you know, if we figure out the social framework, is that going to have an impact on the spatial form? Or, or if I design the spatial form, is that going to influence society and social behavior in this kind of loop? Uh, which, uh, which influences what? And then there's the work of Iris Marion Young, who began to say, you know, be careful about this notion of community. Because communities form typically around sort of common interests, shared identity, whether it's the community that's in the space of your neighborhood, like geography, or the community of the different design disciplines in this school, right? You're, it's a shared identity, a shared belief, a shared value system that brings you together. But sometimes that shared value system excludes, right? Because uh, you're not really integrated. And she's reminding us that maybe it's not about the ideal of community, but it's about this ideal of city life. And that what you really want is different communities working together on a shared set of activities. And that's what we want to move towards. And I think why notions of participatory planning, how you think about who is your client, who do you include at the table that you want to get input from is so important in our design work if, in fact, we're interested in creating more just cities. So I've been working on my own point of view about it through the work we do at our design lab. And right now, where I am is at the just city is where all people and communities, but especially what I call the least not included, have equitable and inclusive access to environments that offer the opportunities and resources to be productive and prosperous, advancing the social, economic, mobility, and agency of both people and place. And I think design has an opportunity to consider both people and place. So that's the big moral of my story. So what can design impact be? The next thing I looked at after I looked at um, social and philosophical movements around justice in general, I began to interrogate different design movements uh, that we are all fairly familiar with. Um, and you know, things like the new urbanism has a very specific charter that they ascribe to. And in some ways, they, they believe that they are ascribing to notions of inclusivity. Um, but I wasn't sure that the way in which often or sometimes um, the aesthetic valuation of new urbanism considers a broader diversity of communities, a broader diversity of traditions that are allowed to participate in the actual form making of the city. Um, everyday urbanism, Margaret Crawford and John Kaliski sort of say, you know, people make the city. So we as designers sort of set up the streets and blocks and some certain formal frameworks, but we and our identities and our cultural identities appropriate that space and we're actually designing the identity of the space. And this is what we as designers should let um, citizens do. The recent movement around tactical urbanism, uh, social impact design. Um, and when it started, it was really about you all as designers feeling like I'm not gonna wait for a client to give me a project. I'm gonna find a space and I'm going to you know, disrupt that space and I'm gonna design something in it. Then from this became a critique around, well, are you designing for the community, by the community, or with the community? Um, and some communities began to question the role of the designer's intention. Sustainable urbanism, sustainable urbanism, um, resiliency planning, resilient design, um, predicates itself on addressing issues of equity. And I think that's important, but I think sometimes um, equity is not enough. Um, sometimes what communities are looking for are, is representation, power, participation, and engagement. And that's not always an equity proposition. Equity is often about distributing material goods, 
But equity also needs to be about distributing non-material goods. Again, who's at the table of decision making? And landscape urbanism as well, which is also looking at the frames of how the ecology shapes the city. Um, and it tends to work at these larger systemic scales, but what about the smaller scale? So my notion is to move towards something called just urbanism. And what I was looking for was a disruptive framework of policies and practices that produce outcomes designed to break down historic structures and systems of oppression, inequality, and access. And what I feel like I'm wanting to do with this framework is to be very explicit about the systems of oppression and the way in which design needs to attack those in ways that I thought those other frameworks weren't speaking to in really clear and precise ways. I think it requires aspects of restorative justice. I think it has to be disruptive. Uh, it's got to make somebody upset. <laughs> it's got to be value-based. Uh, it, it requires cultural competency. And, and in that, I mean understanding and accepting that we're different and not believing in a, a universal design code, but recognizing that different cultures uh, use space in different ways, and we all need to develop a competency for understanding and valuing that equally. It must be cross-disciplinary, um, as your new uh, director is talking about transdisciplinary design. Um, it should value community expertise and knowledge just as much as it values ours. Uh, it should include the grass tops, uh, established leadership as well as grassroots. Uh, it is inherently political. If we're going to ask ourselves to uh, interrogate and attack systems of oppression, that's a form of political action, um, and it needs accountability. So that's my frame of just urbanism for now. So practice modes. Um, so a few examples. One is through engagement uh, might be a way that we begin to realize just urbanism. So I've been working on in uh, the design lab a way of designing a series of values, indicators, and metrics that I think are more robust than some of the systems that I've seen um, that address sustainability and resiliency. And uh, the poster is here, and I've given uh, Jason a number of copies. So if you're interested in one, please see him, and you can even have this one. Um, and it's because I want communities to be able to write their own uh, story of what a just Phoenix is, different from a just Chicago, different from a just Dallas, different from a just um, Seattle. I think all of those cities have really different nuances, right? Uh, a just St. Louis may really find it necessary to talk about respect because they're so challenged right now by police brutality in addition to safety and security and equity, right? Whereas here, your value is something else, and I'm not going to make them up. You could look at the index and select them for yourself. And so the idea is to use this as a participatory tool to create a city's own manifesto. Here um, at a conference we do every two years at Harvard called Black in Design, um, we ask 16 designers to use their products that they designed um, use this index and tell us what values they thought the specific design strategies that they used um, achieved. In this particular example, we looked at a project called Creative Reaction Lab, which is a firm that actually does participatory design work in communities and also has a specific component that trains youth to actually do the facilitation and engagement around design. Um, so they went through the exercise and determined the values that they thought their program addressed. We also asked the 125 participants that came to the workshop to tell us the values that were most important in the cities that they came from. And so this is just a word cloud of the values that were most important for different regions. So in your region, equity, resilience, and power were most referenced by folks that came from the West Coast. Uh, in the Midwest, prosperity and equity were more important. On the East Coast, power and community were important. So for us, it was kind of interesting to see, depending on what part of the country you're in, what some of the designers felt were important uh, to them. So the whole idea is to really think about um, a value-based approach to starting design work and how this index could be a tool for establishing uh, that proposition. Uh, this was a project at a time 
before the city went into bankruptcy, but they had an extraordinary amount of vacant land and property, uh, a declining population and a declining economy. And so the idea was how do we look at all of those things, how they relate to one another, and what the new plan would be to transform the city. We did a number of things that were different and new for Detroit. Uh, we created a very broad um, uh, network uh, of leadership for the city that included, as I said, those top-down grassroots plus um, grass tops, all at the same table of decision-making. Um, we established what we call 12 imperatives, the things that had to change in order for the city to move forward. Um, and we basically redesigned the physical urban form of the city. We looked at um, where employment was. Uh, employment used to be only downtown and only in a few places, but we actually found that there was places for jobs to grow in more places than just the city. Um, the transportation network only followed the historic radials of the city, um, making it very hard to get north, south, and east, west, so we created this new loop. Um, the, the green space, uh, open space uh, map of the city was just these little specks of very small parks, but we realized that because they had so much vacant land that it was the opportunity to create other types of productive landscapes. And then we radically changed the, um, the, the types of neighborhoods uh, that could be developed in the city, ultimately creating a longer term vision plan. Um, we translated this in a way that um, average people could understand by creating these kind of cartoons. And one of the things that I practice in my work is recognizing, and this is one of the, the, the aspects of doing planning and urban design work, is you are talking to multiple constituents. So the ability to translate this technical work in a number of different voices and a number of different mediums is really important to the effectiveness of how a plan is used going forward. If I just showed my grandmother those plans, she'd be like, I don't know what that is. Right? <laughs> but if I walk her through the story of what I mean, which is we need to figure out um, how do we create a better system of ownership. Detroit is a city of 82% African Americans, but the, the, the percentage of African American business ownership is 15%. So one of the things that we needed to look at was how are we growing entrepreneurship, business ownership, land ownership. So this little story says, okay, in this live work, what we call live make neighborhood, you know, there are these abandoned um, old industrial buildings. What if we start a training program that's teaching uh, young people, uh, oops, young people um, bike repair, for example, right? But not only are we teaching them bike repair, we're also teaching them entrepreneurship. So they're not only learning a skill, but they're learning how to take that skill and make it a business. So then if they have a business, they can go back and rent that building. And then if the business is well, they can go back and own that building. So that's the kind of cycle that we were trying to create through design and economic development, and this is how we wanted to tell the story. Um, again, um, we use very elaborate and multiple forms of engagement. There are lots of different people that you want to be involved in a planning process. Sometimes you just want people to be aware of the process. There are lots of people who don't come out to community meetings unless it's affecting them, but they want to know what's going on, right? So we had platforms that did that. Uh, we had platforms that for people who really wanted to have a conversation, so we had these telephone town halls. We had an open house. We had a 24-7 gaming event that lasted for seven days, and through that we were able to um, it, through our numbers, over 25% of the people who engaged in our planning work were under the age of 18, which is very unusual for a planning process. Um, the plan was not just about a planning framework, it was really about implementation. So at the time that we released the plan in 2013, and this is just an early sketch, uh, intended to show uh, how we were going to raise money and start to make investments, not just in the downtown, which was everybody's fear, but even in the neighborhoods. Um, and this is one of the, the um, implementation tactics that came out of this. So we had a number of different community leaders that were helpful in designing and executing our engagement strategies. So um, the Kresge Foundation funded them to become an organization. So now you have these folks now in a more institutionalized sort of framework to allow for um, 
helping communities uh, actually implement some of the strategies that we came up with. Um, another form of uh, mode of practice is through measurement. So this is a study that we did with Gail Studio. Uh, Jan Gail uh, is a fairly well-known urban designer who looks at the effectiveness of public space and city life. And we wanted to understand whether public plazas in New York were creating better public life and better urban justice. So we combined our different methodologies, our, my value-based approach to, with his approach at looking at city life. Um, we used desktop research, we did intercept surveys, we did observational surveys, and we interviewed plaza owners. Uh, there are over uh, 50 of these throughout New York. We looked at seven in three different boroughs. And this is what some of the plazas, the plazas actually take streets that are underutilized and allows the street to become part of the public plaza. And in New York, that's really a big deal at a city that doesn't have a lot of space. You guys have a, like a lot of space, so <laughs> not necessarily a strategy you have to do, but in New York, it, you know, every inch is important. Um, so these are some of the findings we thought were really interesting. So most measurement tools only measure like economic impact. So if I create this public space, can I collect more rents? You know, the property values go up, the safety go down, and those are all fine measurements. But we're really kind of interested in this notion, does public space really bring people together? Do they really interact? Do people feel a sense of ownership? Do people feel safe? So these are just a couple of examples. Um, one of the things we found is that the plazas do foster better social connections. Um, and we looked at it a couple of different ways. Um, we asked people the question, do you recognize more people in the plaza since it opened? And the good news was overwhelmingly yes, except in the plazas in Manhattan. So in the plazas in Manhattan, people didn't tend to socialize and make connections as much as they did in the neighborhood plazas. We were also able to look at it by income, and this was really interesting. Most social connections were made by people who make less money. So richer people didn't tend to engage with one another. People of certain um, income levels tended to interact a little bit. Now, what we didn't know and what we suspect could be the reason for this are two. One, it could be young people who just make less money, or two, seniors who also make less money. And those were two cohorts that we found use open space in the plazas the most. So that, that might explain the income. We asked people, if they felt a sense of ownership of the plaza. Do you feel like the plaza belongs to you or your neighborhood? And we had a fairly high response for that too. And we're also able to understand it by different neighborhoods. And there was a very high sense of, I feel like this space belongs to me and my neighborhood in the neighborhoods. In the Manhattan, not as much. And again, we attribute that to the fact that in Manhattan, you have lots of visitors and tourists. And if I'm from out of town, I'm not gonna necessarily think the plaza I'm going to in your city belongs to me. Um, we also saw, again, that lower income groups uh, were more represented in the plazas than people of more income. So for some reason, people uh, on the lower end, and again, this could be age or uh, employment status if you're a senior. So it was interesting for us to see who was using the space and why. And then lastly, my academic work. Um, so I teach urban design uh, studios, uh, urban planning studios. I teach a seminar on gentrification. I teach uh, in the urban planning core studio. My design studios tend to have architects, urban designers, planners, landscape architects. Uh, my seminars have everyone from designers to law students, business students, students from the School of Public Health and Education. Uh, this year, I'm doing a studio in St. Louis called Urban Disobedience, 99 Provocations to Disrupt Injustice in St. Louis. So this is another way that I get to test out the role of design. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at the notion uh, and conditions of injustice, the history behind why conditions of injustice exist in the city. This is a quote um, from a rapper, um, Tef Poe, who... Um, uh, became more famous uh, post um, the Michael Brown shooting and the Black Lives Matter movement. He wrote uh, in a Time Magazine article, we don't drive certain places in our very own community after a certain time of night. We avoid suburban communities as much as possible because we fear being unjustifiably locked down and thrown into jail. In St. Louis County, all of the cards are stacked against young black people. So this whole notion of the black body in space. 
Um, we then began to spend time thinking about, well, what is justice and what would justice look like? So there's a famous um, uh, philosophy professor at Harvard, Michael Sandel, that says justice is not only about the right way to distribute things, that distributive justice like equity, it is also about the right way to value things. So this notion of a value proposition that guides your design thinking, I think is imperative. Um, so we first set out to identify 99 problems in St. Louis. Uh, and there was a woman running for mayor who says, the city has 99 problems and financing the construction of a new stadium is not one. So that was her sense of saying, you know, there are many more issues and ways that we should spend our money and she's using Jay-Z to make a point. Um, so we took that cue, and before we went on our field trip to St. Louis, I had the students develop a 99 problems workbook. We actually came up with 127 problems, um, and they organized themselves around these different themes. Uh, these are some of the pages that we came up, so injustice in population, injustice in housing, injustice in unsafe space, injustice in mental health. Um, and I wanted the students to um, have a very data-driven proposition for, ju for just a, for illustrating how injustice happens in the city. So it's a very robust catalog that we created. Uh, we then came back and I wanted them to understand the relationship between different data points. So in the book, every data point is its own data point. But things happen in connection to one another. So we created these uh, Rebecca Solnit um, inspired atlases. Um, and so one is called Atlas of Anxiety. And this student was interested in the notion that in the downtown, even during the daytime, like when people are working, the streets, like there's no one walking the street, kind of like here, maybe a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I'm from New York and Chicago, so my perspective of density is quite different, obviously. Um, but, you know, this was the kind of drawscape that he sort of experienced, like, at 10 o'clock in the morning on, during the day, like, just these parking lots and stuff. But in the same instance, there were these surveillance cameras everywhere, so it just felt really eerie. And so he's contrasting that with the, the notion, with the, the, the fact that most people who work in the city live in the suburbs. And so at five o'clock, there's another kind of emptiness that happens in the downtown. But the, but the suburb, which you see up here, which is actually upside down, is illuminated. So he was contrasting this anxiety of surveillance. And then this student was really interested in the notion of um, yoga, boxing, and gangs. So she was speaking to um, some data we found on uh, young, uh, young teenage boys, aggression, uh, school um, suspension, the prison pipeline data, uh, the concentration of gangs uh, that are predominantly north of the city. There's this street called Del Mar that really does divide the city north and south. And then the presence of where kids like that would have um, organized recreation. So she contrasted one form of aggression, organized aggression, boxing, with where yoga was and how it aligned against the, that split between black and white. Um, neighborhoods of more violence or not. And so it was a way for the students to really understand the relationship of different data points and how they play themselves out in the city. Um, so their final assignment, well, they had two final assignments, but our, our main assignment was disruption. So how can design, remember I told you that we need to be disruptive, that somebody's gotta be upset by what we do. And so this studio is really kind of to challenge them, like take a problem that, you, that really upsets you or really tugs at your heartstring and really bothers you and tell me what you would do to radically change it, right? And Theaster Gates says, I want to question not by petitioning or organizing in the stereotypical activist way, but by building and making good use of things forgotten. So he's using sort of the blight and abandonment as, as his protest against um, conditions, but turning that into a design disruption. I don't have the videos with me, but um, we divide the students up into four teams, and they each create a video manifesto for Just St. Louis. So these are just stills from the four different videos that they create. Um, and I've done this for a number of classes, so if you go to the lab's website, designforthejustcity.org, you can find 25 
just city manifestos that students have done over the last six or seven years. And I just think, again, remember I was saying that using different medium to communicate, and I just find that the video format has been a really compelling way not only for the students to develop their own point of view um, and the values that they want to instill, but also how we can communicate to our different audiences about what we heard you say. Okay, so now what they're doing is coming up with the 99 disruption. So this was a workshop we did where I gave them a definitive, I, we had two hours and I said, okay, come up with 99. And they were like, what, really? So each student has to come up with about eight. And they were really amazed that, that on a quick period of time, if you just let the ideas flow and you don't try to refine it, you don't try to ask yourself, is it practical, is it right? Uh, but you just let yourself push through trying to break through a problem that you might actually come up with some really provocative and interesting ideas. So the last weeks of the studio, they're in their final sprint of coming up with 99 different ideas to challenge. So you can see this taxonomy that we start to create here of the, the major challenges and the values and how different tactics address certain values and address certain problems. Um, lastly, the Design Lab uh, just um, opened an ex exhibition at the Graduate School of Design. Um, and we have taken over the library uh, and the exterior wall of the building, uh, which no one has done before, I was told. And so we've put our index on the exterior wall of our library here, which is really cool. Um, and we looked at four projects um, and their conditions of injustice and interviewed each of the designers and had them tell us what values they use and how different design features um, actually address the challenge of the injustice and different values. So one of them is the 11th Street, 11th Street Bridge Park in um, DC. Another one is that Creative Reaction Lab civic engagement um, firm in St. Louis. Uh, another one is called a day labor station, which was a um, station for immigrant workers who typically just kind of hang out by a bus stop or outside of a grocery store, completely unprotected. And, and, and as we think about our immigration conversation now, that's a very unsafe space to be. Um, and then another one was a temporary installation in um, a, a museum in New York. So we've transformed the library um, as a way to get students to engage or visitors to the library to engage with this notion of the just city and the way in which taking these kind of abstract terms and having them explore how designers have taken those abstract terms and really tried to use them to inspire the way they think about their design solutions. Um, we've actually curated um, a, a wall of scholarship of, of different books. Uh, that talk about conditions of injustice, predominantly in the United States, but also talk about uh, the way design strategies have been used to combat those. Uh, and then the last part of it is um, we feature um, six different voices, what we call the talking heads. Um, and each talking head is talking about um, the condition of injustice in their city and their vision for a more just city and which values from our index they think are most important to address the just city. This just happens to be Brandon Bro. He um, is a graphic designer. Um, he was actually one of the featured speakers at Black and Design Conference. He designed the cover art for Chance the Rapper from Chicago, and he's also um, creating programs for youth um, to, to help them understand um, the role of art and artists in thinking about their own communities. Um, so you can go around and listen to each of the different uh, talking heads, and there we are. So designforthejustcity.org is where you can find uh, information on a lot of the work that the Design Center is doing, uh, and I welcome any questions. Thank you.